The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that first, that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the, peop then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now, eight days later, the disciples were again in the house. And Thomas was with them. The doors were shut. But Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, for indeed your word has brought peace into the fear and darkness of our existence. Your rising has conquered sin and death, and we gather once again in your name to hear your word and have our spirits lifted and the peace that passes all understanding descend upon us. This peace, this gift is not ours alone, O Lord, for you give it to us to take it out. You send us forth from this place so that we may share this good news with others. Empower our proclamation in the world, Lord, and let us live into this gift that you have given us. Now may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Let's see, how does it go? Christos Anesti. It's, a, today, it's a, a word I was reminded of. I have several friends. You know, there's interesting, Jacksonville's kind of an interesting town in, in a lot of different ways from, a, from a, a, an ethnic or, or kind of a, ba a background. Where do, where do people come from? And we have a huge Orthodox community in Jacksonville. Uh, in fact, uh, several of my former students are members of some of the, uh, uh, of some of the various uh, Middle Eastern uh, uh, Orthodox churches uh, in our community. There's a huge number of them. In fact, there's a big, beautiful Syriac Catholic church uh, over uh, right behind UNF, and you've got several uh, Orthodox churches. Today is Pasha uh, in the Orthodox church. It is their Easter, and so... Uh, they are proclaiming the same words today that we shouted aloud last week, Christos and Esti! He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And so uh, the, the gift of Easter continues. This gift that we receive from Jesus Christ, our Lord, His resurrection being made manifest not only in the lives of the disciples, as we read in our Gospel text for today, but in our very own lives as well. And we have to ask ourselves, how is the, the gift of the resurrection really manifest in our lives? And I couldn't help but look down and see that psalm text. 
Now, unfortunately, for a lot of different reasons, we don't always get the opportunity to, to read the psalm, but I'd like to encourage you to get out, the, get out your, your manila inserts right now, and, and let's read just that, that first verse of Psalm 133 this morning together. And I think it's important for us to, to read it together. And I think once you take a look at the words, you'll understand where I'm coming from here. Let us say it together. I know it's, in, it's not in bold. I know we're, we're, we're getting outside the rules here, but that's okay. We can say it together. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in your unity. Indeed, how pleasant it is when we do dwell in unity and we gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ this day, the one who is crucified and risen indeed. We are gathered in his name. And so there is that unity between us that would probably have no other connection to each other except for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how good indeed and pleasant it is when we, the disciples of Christ, come together to dwell, to hear His Word, to share His Supper in holy communion. Yet communion is seems to be such a challenge in our world today, does it not? So much darkness at work to derail the unity amongst us within this society. And there are so many things, outside the church especially, racial tensions, socioeconomic divisions, the generation gap, gender inequality, religious hatreds, ideological conflict, and yes, even technology. I mean, how many of you have ever been to a restaurant, right? And we talk about the idea of, of people coming together and sitting down and sharing a meal together. How many of you have been to a restaurant recently and seen a family? I see this scene and it really disturbs me. Then it, then it reminds me that I probably need to keep my own phone in my pocket during dinner because that's, that's a harder thing. But you know, you can look around at a dinner table and I don't know if this is happening at home. I'm, I'm assuming it does. If it's going to happen in a, in a restaurant where people gather together, I'm sure it's going to happen in their homes where technology serves to undermine every human effort to create community. Why can't we all just get along? The old phrase goes. But fear is often the source of divisions among us. And of course, we know that fear leads us out of the light and into the darkness. In His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ breaks into our fears and announces peace. Isaiah, of course, reminds us that by His stripes we are healed. The marks He bore on the cross, He bore for us. That Easter message continues today. And it reminds us that He overcame the greatest of our fears, death and the grave. And so when we encounter the risen Lord, like the disciples in our Gospel text for today, our hearts are gladdened. We encounter the risen Christ in community. Where the disciples gather. And that's what we see in our text, right? They are gathered together. I suppose they have figured out there is some kind of strength in numbers. They are afraid. And this is where Jesus meets them. The church, of course, is where the assembly becomes community. Where the disciples gather. And of course, this unity that Christ offers is one that is a true unity in Him. The church is the assembly equipped. And this, we receive the Holy Spirit. We see the gift of the Holy Spirit here in our gospel text for today. We are unified by Christ's words for a common purpose. To proclaim this gospel of forgiveness. I'm going to do it again. Roxanne, I'm going to get in trouble right now. I saw a movie last night. Yeah, I, I'm not going to give away the plot, but there's a movie that just came out recently. It's, it came out on Amazon. I don't go into theaters anymore and watch movies. I, can just, I got Amazon, so I can watch it on Amazon. Seen the movie Unbroken? 
Did anybody get a chance to see that movie? Fascinating story about a, a, a young man who, uh, who was a, uh, an Olympic athlete and during World War II uh, became a bombardier, a B-49 bombardier, bombardier. And his aircraft crashed over the Pacific and after 40-something days, he's discovered by the Japanese and is put into a prisoner of war camp. This is a true story. True story of a gentleman who went through years of, uh, I guess hell is really, that's the best way you could describe what it was that he went through. And it's a story of forgiveness as well because in one of those camps, the kind of the, the, the officer, the leader of the camp found that because he was the, an Olympic athlete, this was the guy he was going to pick on. Ernie Zampezi is his name. And after years, his desire was to have run in the Olympics. He's a very fast track athlete. He ran in the Olympics before in Berlin in, in the 30s, the one where Jesse Owens won so many, so many uh, gold medals upsetting the Nazis' uh, apple cart. But uh, he was also set to run in the Olympics that came during the war years. And, and I don't know if you remember where that was supposed to have been. Those Olympics were supposed to have been in Tokyo. But they got canceled due to the war. But he eventually would come back to Japan much later during the Nagano Games, ones that were just about a decade ago. It was a torchbearer. He came back to, to, make, to, to offer the hand of, of friendship, of unity, of forgiveness. And the only one who wouldn't meet him was the one they called Little Bird, the, director's, the director of the camp, would not extend the hand that was being extended to him. Forgiveness is a powerful thing. This is the good news that Jesus has extended to us and asks us to extend to others. Today's gospel, what Jesus is bestowing upon the church, is the gospel of forgiveness, known in church circles as the keys of the kingdom. It's spoken also of in the gospel of St. Matthew, where, where the place where Peter confesses his faith in Christ as Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And on this confession of faith, Christ says he will build his church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it, will not prevail against it. The church has been given the keys of the kingdom. And what is bound on earth, Jesus says, will be bound in heaven. And what is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. The binding of sin, of course, comes from unrepentance and the loosing from confession and repentance. When our hearts are unrepentant, we are, as John writes in our second lesson today, self-deceived, shall we say. We do not ask, nor do we seek the comforts of forgiveness, and thus isolate ourselves from one another, as well as from God. Yet when the light of truth and life illumines the darkness, we are led into fellowship together. For it is through forgiveness that the divisions that separate humanity are overcome. And we share a fellowship as ones freed from sin and death by the forgiveness of Christ. Christian fellowship thus begins with confession. I mean, what is it that we do at the beginning of our gathering together? But to ask for forgiveness and to confess our sins. And hearing the, that good word, I always was shocked by this, discovering as a kid that the things that we say in church, you know where they're from? The Bible, of all places. I mean, who would have figured that? That's amazing to hear those words that God is faithful and just 
forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. There it is in black and white. The good news revealed once again. And so we are loosed from the chains which bind us and cleansed in baptism, fed in communion. The church is called to be a community committed to this purpose. To announce the gospel of forgiveness. To announce Christ to bring others to faith. And the purpose is not only to announce this gospel of forgiveness, but to live by it. The purpose is, of course, to also to call believers to a living faith and a living Christ by the proclamation of the Word of God. This Word is not only for the outsider, but for us as we continue our journey of faith. And through the proclamation, God has announced good news that the crucified and risen Jesus is the Messiah. And by faith, we have both life and salvation in His name. Our unity is key in order to be faithful and steadfast in our common mission. Like we read in the Acts text for today, our very first lesson of one heart and one soul sharing the resources God bestows for the common good of the whole community, forgetting no one and leaving none behind. In order, we could read, that the apostles' testimony of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ could be shared. Truly, this Acts text shows us what genuine and authentic community looks like as all things are held in common and we see what the restoration of true human community will look like in paradise. We come to see that the Spirit leads us as He leads us, that God gives us property and resources for our neighbor's benefit. Yet we have no compulsion nor requirement of law. Here is the essence of the get to rather than the have to. The have to of legalism, of course, always nipping at the church's heels. In this, our stewardship, it is a key component of how we follow Christ. For in it we are given the opportunity to offer our time, our money, gifts, and abilities, prayers, as a giving of self as Christ gave himself up for his beloved bride, the church. Well, roadblocks to this community abound. There are divisions of all types, some of which I mentioned before. But these are all merely symptoms of sin, darkness, and brokenness of humanity. And so we come together to confess our sins and pray for the Spirit's guidance and to be refocused on mission and ministry, that to which we have been called by our bridegroom. And we take comfort in the fact that it, it is Christ's church and He has sustained it throughout all generations and will continue to do so. And we also take comfort in the fact that Christ came to call sinners to confession and forgiveness, has called us to faith, called us to serve. And in these things we find our unity as we are found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us take a moment to reflect on this call, the Spirit's gift and the forgiveness we receive in Christ.